Well, I make it just past uh, three o'clock. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome you here. So my name is Ray Smith. I'm the Associate Dean for Executive Education at the Dalmore School of Business. And uh, we're delighted that you're joining us today and uh, Professor Shevka, uh, who I'll introduce a little more in a moment. This, this series called Business Insights, uh, Managerial Insights, was formed as a way to reach out to our colleagues in the business community to help them think through ways uh, to not just survive within uh, this difficult time, but maybe even emerge from it in a stronger state. Uh, and today's topic is right on course with that. Uh, so this is a collaboration between South Carolina Bus uh, uh, Business Radio uh, and uh, Public Radio in uh, South Carolina, and Mike Switzer in particular. Unfortunately, Mike won't be with us today. Uh, he usually is to ask, ask questions, so um, I'll be stepping in uh, to help him. Uh, so let me introduce you to uh, Professor D Donald Shepka. We all know him as DJ. I suggest you might want to know him as DJ as well. And DJ is going to look, be talking about succeeding during this crisis, and he will be leading us through um, ways of thinking about this, but also in, to, in terms of starting to prepare uh, to emerge on the other side. Uh, so we will have questions at the end. Uh, I will be hosting those questions. If you have a question you want to ask DJ, would you please use the chat function, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Just type your question in, uh, we will see it, and then I'll ask that question on your behalf uh, when DJ uh, finishes his presentation. We are recording this. Um, it will be, when it's recorded, it will be available on our website. It will be on South Carolina Business Radio's website, and it will be uh, sent out on social media. If you found this very interesting, then please let other people know about it. Uh, we have uh, more in the series, and we'll be talking a bit about that at the end as well. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet, and I'm gonna hand over to DJ. DJ. Thank you, Ray, I appreciate that. And welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us today as we talk about uh, succeeding during crisis. So I'd like to take a little bit of time to follow up on the radio interview that Mike Switzer and I did last week and expand on some of those ideas a little bit further. I know that uh, this time has created a lot of uncertainty and it's important to talk both about how we respond to crisis, uh, but a little bit about what we've learned and what we can do going forward. Uh, some background, as Noah's Ray has mentioned, I'm a professor in the management department uh, with, a, with a specific focus on strategic management. So what is it uh, that businesses can do to succeed within the confines of their missions and their visions? Uh, but I'm also involved in our Center for Exec Executive Succession, where I'm the research director. A lot of our insights that I'll be discussing here come from talking about uh, what's happening during this crisis with our corporate partners and what they are doing uh, in terms of managing their workforces, but also managing their businesses. So let me share what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, hopefully you all can see this PowerPoint, uh, but I want to have four things that are on my agenda. The first of which is really talking about how the crisis has had differential impacts on different businesses, what that means. The second is the multiple phases that companies are going through as they attempt to respond to this crisis. The third is lessons that we've learned so far and what that might mean for the future. And then the finally, I'd like to end with how to succeed going forward with a real focus on uh, changes to business models. So if we start, we can think of the impact of the crisis ranging from severe with some companies being very negatively affected to, in some cases, even having a positive impact. Uh, severe impacts really are uh, significantly decreased revenue, very long-term recoveries, perhaps in the area of three, maybe as long as five years, although most likely scenarios seem to be about three years. Uh, significant reductions in non-essential capital expenditures, real workforce reductions. And some of those industries include airlines, uh, hotels, tourism, and anything that might have to supply to those industries as well. Uh, most companies are going to experience what, are, what we're terming or what I would term moderate impacts. 
Uh, those have declines in revenue. There are serious disruptions in supply chains. And it's really going to force a review on capital allocation strategies over the next 12 to 24 months, most likely. Uh, immediate effects have already been felt, but there are also going to be long-term strategic decisions that those organizations have to think about as they figure out how to respond. And then there's a whole variety of companies that have actually experienced financially positive impacts. Uh, significant revenue increases, there are real opportunities for them to respond to, uh, but they also need to consider changes to their business model going forward. But even when you think about it in terms of this con similar question of how do we balance the needs of our employees, our customers, and society at large while still meeting their mission. And that's to note that even those that may have positive financial uh, outcomes are still being strained in significant ways. So they're facing severe challenges with their workforces. How do we manage our workforces? Uh, and severe challenges are likely to come in the future as they continue to figure out what to do. And so as companies have tried to respond to this, those responses have really fallen or, or are beginning to fall in three different phases. And so regardless of whether those impacts are severe, moderate, or positive, we're really seeing uh, these three different phases take flight. So the first was the initial response. And I know we talked a little bit about this in the interview, but most of that work was done by the end of March. That doesn't mean there aren't still some of these protocols that are continuing and being built and more will happen as we learn more about the virus. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully these won't have to be initiated again in the future, but at least they provide a blueprint in case there was a need to initiate them again for what we might do. The initial response was entirely about figuring out what to do once all new restrictions were placed on organizations. And so these could vary widely depending on the industry in which you participate. This responses, which are trying to figure out in this new era of working, what is it that we can do to help sustain and continue our business in a way that has as few disruptions as possible. And so companies have begun to identify the short-term operational changes they can make that deliver value. And those that are most successful will do that in accordance with their strategic priorities. Uh, many have identified the essential staff and begun to restructure their workforce in accordance with current operations. A lot of that has to, is very similar to how we react to down, economic downturns, recessions, and depressions where we really start to figure out how do we strategically allocate our workforce in ways that can deliver the most value. Uh, and so that includes how do we internally redeploy our workforces and find what can we do that best utilizes uh, our current skill capabilities. This second response phase has really been about identifying the short-term impacts on our business, its needs, and how we respond to them going forward. The final phase, which we're starting to move into now, and is really going to take anywhere from three months to two years, depending on the level of impact that companies have faced, is about moving forward. And so the goal in moving forward is really to identify the investments that we can afford to make and we need to make to exit this crisis in an economically advantaged way. And so I'd like to talk first about the things that we've learned and then a little bit about what are those things that we can do to move forward in an economically advantaged way. So let's start with a couple of lessons that we've learned that I think are really potentially beneficial going forward. Uh, the first is leaders rising to the challenge or occasion, and there are more of those that are rising than that, those that are not. And that crisis truly has revealed the character of leaders. One of the most interesting aspects of this, uh, of this lesson has actually been, this is without regard to organizational hierarchy, that there are many leaders who have exceeded their capabilities that were previously expected and done so without worrying about titles or positions. 
those leaders are moving quickly to the top of the class when we think about their capabilities and what the future might hold for their ambitions. The second thing that we're seeing is that leaders really have a lot more capacity than we previously may have given them credit for. That individuals are stepping up in a very strong ways, again, outside of the positional or status, traditional status hierarchy, to challenge what we thought we knew about them previously. And they're moving very quickly at times and doing so by creating very strong communication between not only themselves and those whom they work most closely together with, but also others in the organization with, who, with whom they may not previously have worked. One of the real challenges going forward though is to figure out how do we harness that capacity if there is no crisis present? So how do we actually help further push our employees to illustrate the capacity, but also do so without breaking our employees. And so it's important to understand that we need to help figure out how to best harness the potential of all individuals and stakeholders in the organization, but do so in a way that helps the organization and those individuals together. The third lesson is that organizations actually can change extremely quickly under significant pressure. And this is largely contrary to a lot of existing or known change management paradigms. Change is very difficult. Everybody would, for the most part, agree with that. At the same time, we have undergone extremely rapid and difficult change in a very short period of time. In March, it certainly was very quickly to move to entirely new operating uh, routines, new business models for many organizations, and even today, as the country begins to reopen, we're going to see a lot of restrictions that are placed that force companies to rethink their business models as well. What does that really mean? Uh, the interesting aspect, though, is that we can change. And so hopefully going forward, one of the big lessons and one of the experiences that we've had is that overcoming the hurdles to change for the right reasons should be a lot easier than we expected. And so I encourage anybody in organizations to actually continue to push to ensure that change happens, but also listen, and that when change is blocked for illegitimate reasons to continue to push forward the change, but when resistance is met because people have legitimate concerns about the change, listen to others and figure out the appropriate solutions. One of the most important aspects of change management is communication of why change is necessary. And so it's important to ensure that we continue to illustrate why organizations have to change. The fourth thing that, we, that we've identified is that an organization's culture and its values are critical to making its strategic decisions. So while many people look at mission statements and vision statements as potentially being lacking true meaning, having a core set of values and a true mission the organization follows actually makes decision-making in a time of crisis much easier. Because once we have alignment on this is what the organization stands for, it's easy to empower our employees and others within the organization to make quick decisions. It allows for agility and nimbleness that, may not have had, that we may not have had otherwise. But in all decisions, when boards, when CEOs, when other senior executives have talked about how did we know what decisions were the right one? The easy answer is to point back to what our values are. So I encourage everybody to ensure that you know and understand the organization's mission, its vision, and its key values, the critical things that it actually believes are important to its core and its foundation, because those help understand and guide what decisions we should take. The fifth thing that we've identified is really four strong characteristics of leaders that have been successful through this pandemic. They're visible, we can see them, not just in reality, but virtually as well. They're communicative. They're taking the time to, uh, to talk to others, to explain the situation, to share information, and be brokers and bridges across divides that may have traditionally existed, but to help make things happen more quickly. So they're inspirational. They can share ideas and help others understand how they can actually accomplish one and two on this list. How can you better rise to the challenge and meet the needs in way of the organization 
in ways that we have not previously met those needs. And finally, they have to be able to act with speed and agility. Perhaps the single most important characteristics of success, characteristic of senior leaders and top executives today is the ability to be adaptable and to illustrate their talents and their capabilities across a wide variety of opportunities. And today is a very strong opportunity to illustrate your ability to be adaptable. And so what does this mean going forward? There are several things that I think are critical to organizations as they look to exit this crisis. The first is we need to gain alignment uh, for the future and think about where are we trying to go and how do we get there. Alignment and decision making, especially under uncertainty, can be achieved under two conditions. The first is everybody has to agree with the reality we're facing. And so once you can get the entire senior leadership team to agree, here is what the future is likely to be, knowing both best and absolute worst case scenarios, along with what is most likely to happen, enables us to better make decisions that are in accordance with what we think is most likely to happen in the future. The second is we have to have agreement on the common core values of the company. As we've noted before, the values, the culture, the mission of the organization are its North Star as we make decisions. If we don't have alignment on both where we think we are likely to go and what we think are the core values of the company, making decisions is going to be very difficult. So it's important that we all identify today what we think the key of the future is going to be before we can start making the operational plans to actually get there. This, the second thing that we can do is to devise a rollout and investment plan for strategically transitioning when recovery begins. What that means is revisiting planned investments, reprioritizing them, and preparing for investing in high growth areas and deprioritizing low growth segments. So return to the drawing board and look at where were we planning to go in the next three to five years and is that still relevant today? And start to reassess, where do we think we'll have the biggest impact as we start to strategically invest, whether it's research and development, advertising spending, or even just considering channels in which we compete? Where might that be most successful in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months for now? The third thing we can do is we have to be nimble. And the ability to make decisions quickly can have very strong impacts going forward. So think about how we want to be able to pivot along the way and where we might need to go. And the easiest way to do this is by considering the entire contingency plan for all future eventualities. So really consider what is the best case scenario, what's the worst case scenario, and even in between, what might that mean? If we have to pivot from best case to worst case, what might that look like so that we're not caught being reactive, but instead we have the chance to be proactive. As a strategic management professor, the one thing that I constantly talk to my students about is really about being proactive to the situation at hand. And so while at times we may feel we must have to react, as soon as we can flip that on its head and allow us to be thoughtful about what might happen even over two weeks or a month to start, that will make that next month much easier. It's the difference between playing a game of chess and a game of checkers. And the final thing to really do and what I wanna focus the rest of our discussion on is consider the need to adapt business models to face an altered reality. Uh, you can identify changes in consumer behavior and replan quickly. You have to be able to pivot and reallocate resources to prioritize the future. And the best way to do this is to use the business model canvas to assess. And so there are many tools that you know, for using and outlining what a business model might be, but I think the best tool that we have is the business model canvas. There are many resources that are available on the internet that will actually outline different areas of the business model canvas. But the point is to really think about two things. One is what are the sources of revenues that drive the revenue side of our business? So how do we actually achieve sales? and who is necessary and what's the process by which that is done. And the other is what are the processes by which we incur costs to deliver the revenue side of the business. In the end, our business model is the means by which we actually generate a profit. And so the business model canvas actually covers uh, nine different areas with a variety of questions that you can use 
to evaluate different aspects of the business model. For instance, one area for consideration today is revenue streams. How are we actually generating revenue and how do we can keep generating that revenue in the future? Entertainment companies like Disney and Comcast who have very wide and disparate entertainment businesses are facing really difficult challenges in some parts of their business in very different realities than others. For instance, Disney, Comcast who owns Universal really have to consider what does the revenue stream for theme parks look like over the next 12 to 18 months? Well, at the same time, valuing or identifying what's the challenge to the entertainment media side of our business. So what do our cable networks look like? What are our broader, um, what are broader over the air networks? What are they looking like? And how do we continue to react in a time in which there's no new live content potentially? Uh, channels are also an important consideration. So in channels, you might think about, say, Universal's decision to launch a movie direct to consumer over on-demand outlets as opposed to going through the movie theater, movie exhibitioners. That, that decision and the decision to potentially keep doing that after the pandemic has long-term ramifications, as we've already seen in their public feud now with AMC theaters. But what companies can really do is really assess how and where do we create value? Where and how can we minimize costs in ways that we haven't done so before? And how can I create value in an, in an additional set of ways that I haven't done? It's likely, to see, it's likely to see changes in the future that are consistent with what we've actually witnessed during this pandemic, where you might have, say, more online ordering for fast casual dining establishments. And the restaurant atmosphere may change drastically, or it may have a different way. There just may be two different business models that companies use going forward. In the end, the goal of the business model canvas is to truly map out how do we identify our revenue sources and the cost to provide that revenue, and then think going forward, where might these things change? How do we alter how we develop relationships and with whom we develop those relationships and what we might be able to do in the future? Considering these nine areas can give a lot of insight into where does the organization actually create value and how might that be fundamentally altered by this crisis? So these considerations, I think, will have the most value as we truly think strategically about how we can succeed coming out of this pandemic. If you have any questions about what we've talked about today, I'm more than happy to answer them both during this chat, but also afterwards. So my email and information uh, that you can send me any contact, any information that you might have any time can, uh, can be found here. Uh, but I'm also open to any questions that we might have. So thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, DJ, for, for that. It's fascinating. Uh, let me remind everyone that um, if you want to ask a question of DJ, um, if you would like to let me know what your question is via chat, which you find at the bottom of the page, send, send us a text, and I will present that question uh, to DJ. In the meantime, uh, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I was fascinated by your talk on leaders and the notion that there are emerging leaders being discovered in organizations that perhaps weren't noticed before. Um, what do you think of the ramifications of this for companies as they go forward? A, they have a hierarchy perhaps or a structure with leaders and defined leaders in certain places. And now you have these other ones popping up uh, showing real leadership talent. So what are the implications, not just for the company going forward, but for the way we think about uh, leadership development? Sure, I, I think it's an important question, Ray. And I think that uh, one of the considerations is the skills and the characteristics that we desire in leaders is constantly changing. But this is highlighting, highlighting in particular the ability to uh, cross organizational boundaries, to quickly adapt to cons changing considerations, uh, but also be very communicative. But, you know, I, it's also important to note that in a very short time frame, we've actually seen the opportunity for individuals to grow very, very rapidly and to il illustrate their skill sets in ways that might have taken 18 months to two years uh, in the past. And so it's actually accelerated the development of many potential leaders uh, in ways that I think have long-term beneficial impacts for organizations. 
as they think about how do we manage uh, across a variety of platforms really are high value talent. And so it gives an opportunity to move individuals throughout the organization to do cross training, uh, to alter our succession planning, to really think about who is at what part of the organization, and then to start career mapping, to think about now that we've seen these skills and capabilities, what, what, how, we, how might we create further stretch assignments uh, that individuals can continue to grow, hopefully at a pretty rapid rate. Okay. Now we have a question that's come in from uh, our, our audience. Uh, somebody who was a graduate of the Moore School had learned uh, and has a very healthy respect for uh, scenario planning, contingency planning. Uh, but this person says, from a strategic management perspective, how do you see scenario planning evolving as a result of the COVID-19 crisis to perhaps better encompass those situations previously not thought, thoroughly analyzed? Well, I, I think that's a great question as well. And I, you know, this is, this is a real challenge and something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is how do we deal with these types of previously unforeseen circumstances going forward? In almost any crisis, uh, it's difficult to envision them ex ante. So it's hard to know beforehand when they're going to occur. But after the fact, there's often uh, a lot that we can do that says, or a lot that we learn too, that says maybe we should have known sooner. And so I think that what is happening right now is an exponentiated growth of organizations really considering uh, a lot more scenarios going forward. And so this requires really a lot more time at the senior executive level and even the board of directors level to consider a variety of contingencies that might happen in the future and prepare. Uh, organizations, I think, are all too often reactive to things that happen, not just crises, but in general. There's a lot of firefighting that occurs and a lot more strategically needs to be done to be proactive. And so my guess would be over the next three to five years, we'll see a lot more scenario planning at the board level where uh, the most important thing that they can do is, is create risk assessments. <clears throat> so it's important for the board and senior management to conduct a very detailed assessment of the potential high, medium, and low risks that the organization faces in the future, the likelihood that they occur, and start planning for those realistically. And I'm assuming that some of, one of the, the things they might be wanting to prepare for is what happens when the leadership themselves become incapacitated uh, for whatever reason. You have thoughts on that? No, and that's a, that's a very important point. There have been a number of high profile uh, executives that have faced uh, similar challenges in the past, but this really illustrated a potentially very severe problem uh, for organizations. We actually have, uh, through the Center for Executive Succession, a detailed checklist for planning for emergency succession because many organizations don't, haven't always thought through really what does it mean. There's the classic hit by the bus scenario, but legally for publicly traded companies, there's a, a, a lot of legal requirements that have to be dealt with. In addition to just managing the message of what's happened. In this scenario, it also wasn't entirely clear what was truly a reportable event. So if a chief financial officer or chief marketing officer comes into contact with somebody who has the virus, it's not entirely clear whether we have to notify the public that that's happened, even if we don't know that they have it. Uh, but it's important to think about the message that's being sent by the company. I, our, our real understanding is that there's going to be a lot more scenario planning in particular for C-suite succession, emergency successions going forward but there's a lot of work that really needs to be done because not a lot of time has historically been spent on that uh, at, at the board level, other than knowing who the next successor might be. Thank you. We have uh, another question from uh, our audience. Uh, thank you, DJ. Uh, with shifting sands happening almost daily in the corporate land landscape, I'd like to know more about how to get the most out of a value proposition. Sure, I, th I think that's a difficult question because it really gets into the fundamental uh, mission of the organization. What is it we're trying to accomplish and how do we accomplish it? So one of the things I think is always important to point out 
is you will never find a company's mission to, to make money. But good missions, if we accomplish them, we will make money. So get down to the notion of what is it that we're trying to do and who is it that we're trying to serve and then how do we best serve those needs. To give an example, with the restaurant industry's challenges that they're facing today, uh, many have had to really think about what is it that we're offering and how do we best offer that. So they've begun thinking about different channels through which we provide it, but also what is it that they're providing, uh, and then build out the resources to serve that need. And so while many were probably previously hesitant to do it, those that started to build that prior to the pandemic were actually probably much more uniquely well served when this started to meet the needs of, of customers in this world. And so when you think about a value proposition, uh, it's most important to actually ask yourself, what are the pain points and the needs that you're trying to solve? So really think about what keeps people up at night and what are the challenges they have and then identify how do we best meet that need. Okay, thanks. Now, obviously, one of the things that's been happening that we've all experienced and we're experiencing at this moment is that the way that we work, uh, the way that we interact with uh, the markets, the way we interact with each other has also changed. What do you think some of the lessons learned are uh, from this kind of virtual experience that we're going through at the moment that might be applicable as we, we emerge from the other side of this? Sure. I, I think that many of the hurdles to communicating and meeting virtually uh, that were previously thought to exist have been run through at record pace. And so virtual communication is much more likely to continue into the future. That does not mean that I necessarily believe there will be an, a massive increase in, say, flexible work arrangements or that everybody will begin working at home. Uh, instead, I think it's much more likely that it's far easier to manage complexity than it has ever been. And we don't actually have to do so while traveling. And so while there may have been a lot of travel in order to manage that complexity and coordinate organizations, the ability to do that relatively successfully virtually illustrates that how we communicate around the world is likely going to change in the future. This has even been illustrated at the board level where a lot of companies we work with note that they're having routine weekly, even bi-weekly meetings with their boards of directors, uh, but that individual directors are now popping in virtually a lot more often. So it can actually significantly increase the involvement of the members of the board of the directors, which has historically been a real corporate governance concern. Uh, whether or not that's a good long-term thing, if they're continually being involved, is it's hard to know whether or not that will really be effective corporate governance, but it does help create a level of engagement that may not have otherwise existed. And I think that things like that are likely to continue, as well as, say, online symposiums or meetings like this where we can continue to use knowledge and thought generation, thought leadership to actually have stimulating discussions without actually having everybody in the same room together. So whereas a symposium might require everybody to fly to New York City, uh, costing people a day or two of their time to meet for several hours, if that same meeting can be held virtually with a lot of the information you discussed, as long as it's secure, that there's a lot of potential benefit that can be taken from that. And so I think going forward, the nature of work will, will be changed in terms of how people interact. Uh, I don't know that it'll stop people from working together in an office setting, but it certainly will make it easier, I think, to manage organizations or at least illustrates how, how, how we can do so effectively virtually. Okay, and uh, one last question. Uh, you talked earlier uh, within your presentation about the change in focus uh, particularly to uh, employees, the, the role of employees and, and the attitude of businesses to their employees uh, becoming much more uh, seeable, uh, much more applicable. What do you think that that might mean for the future of businesses as we go forward with that change in focus? Sure, and, and I don't personally know that it's necessarily a changing focus, but what I found, in, and I think what's, what's been evident here, is employees have really been the number one concern that organizations have focused on when making decisions. 
First and foremost, the question is, does this preserve the health, safety, and well-being of our employees? And if it, the answer to that is no, then organizations are, sh are for the most part, shying away from making those decisions. Uh, this departs from often the classical focus of shareholders being the primary stakeholder of the organization. And I think that we've been seeing a, a shift in towards and in the ways in which organizations are thinking about that. Who, what are the needs of their stakeholders and how do we meet them over the last several years? Uh, which culminated with the business roundtables uh, note last year on how do we better manage uh, the needs of all stakeholders rather than merely shareholders. And so I think the end point is really that there is a wide variety of stakeholders to whom we must be concerned, but the notion of focusing on is a very uh, important one going forward to really think about what does that mean as we seek to maintain the health and well-being of our employees, not only during a pandemic, but in all ways outside of this. It has many potential implications. So, DJ, thank you very much. Uh, I think particularly the topic and the, the of, of your conversation and um, everything in your slides is perhaps explains why we started this kind of process to understand exactly what's going on, uh, understand what lessons we can learn uh, going forward and then raise some of the questions and things that we should be thinking about in order to emerge from that. So I'd like to thank you for, uh, for that presentation. Um, DJ works with us on many of our executive education programs in a very important part of, of, of our world. Um, thank you for spending time to come and meet us all. Thank you, Ray. It was a pleasure to be here, and thank you to everybody who took the time to join us today. And I share that. Next week, uh, we are joined by uh, one of our other professors. She's a chair of the management department, uh, Sherry Thatcher. Uh, she will be joining us, first of all, on radio with Mike Switzer, and then on Zoom conference, uh, where she will be talking about um, the role of virtual team working. Uh, during a time of crisis, but very obviously something we're all living with all the time. So um, I hope you'll be able to join us uh, to meet with Sherry next week and listen to what she has to say and the hints that she has for us. In the meantime, uh, DJ's session has been recorded. Um, it will take a couple of days for us to be able to uh, get the transcriptions ready so that we can put it on our websites, but it will be there and it will be shareable. Equally, uh, DJ slides will be available and sent out to all of those who were present or registered to be present at this event, and they will go out with sometime today. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you found this very useful. I hope you found uh, DJ's uh, thoughts and ideas uh, are very appropriate and very actionable. With that, please stay healthy. See you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>